right, on uh, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. It says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. One of the great verses that, that sometimes we we look at and and, uh, and and sometimes we struggle with this verse, that all things work together for good to them that love God. And, and we struggle with it simply because all of us know that sometimes bad things happen. And, and we know that bad things happen even to good people. And so we, we wonder sometimes, well, you know, how can it be that, that all things work together for good? Well, we don't understand. We don't understand how God puts, puts things in our lives together for the good. We don't see it many times, but God does. And, and God tells us that even in the difficult days, in the, in the heartbreak, in, the, in all the difficult things that we go through, that, that God, God somehow in his, in his infinite wisdom and power brings about good things even when things turn out to, in our hearts and our minds to be bad. Now, I want to talk about, I want to talk about, and, and I titled the message tonight, God is so good. God is so good. Even though we see things in our lives that happen that, that we would look at and say, that's bad. That's, that's a horrible thing that I went through, and all of us have been there. There's not a single person here tonight that hasn't had something in your life, somewhere along the line, that, that some bad things have happened. Maybe not bad from the standpoint of, well, it was, it was, it was an evil thing that happened to me. But it was bad to us because it, it broke our heart. It was bad because we went through some, some, some terrible times. And all of us have, have probably had some and, and, or, or we're going to go through some. Uh, somewhere before we leave this world, we'll have some heartbreak. We'll have some difficulty. We'll face some things that, that we will look at and think, boy, I, that was just bad. I wish I had never gone through that. And it's bad simply because it breaks our heart. It's not bad because it's, it's an evil thing that happened. But we all go through, we all go through heartbreak. We all go through difficult times. And so God wants us to understand through this verse, that, you know, he's good. God is good and that he wants us to understand that even in the difficult things that we face, that, that God uses the most difficult things sometimes for good. He somehow works this thing out in our life. He works this thing out to where these things are good. And we can't understand it. And sometimes we won't understand things until we get to heaven. But, we know that God is good and that God does good things. In Matthew chapter 19, I want us to, to look at a verse here in Matthew chapter 19 uh, in which the Lord gives us uh, this verse in, in Matthew 19 and in verse 17. Matthew 19 verse 17 says here, and he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus said there's only one, only one that's good, and that is God. So we learn that God is good. He tells us, Jesus points out that God is good. God is so good to all of us. And you know, sometimes we, we go through things and we, we begin to look and see things and we see tragedies in our life. And people, 
for, for generation after generation since the creation of time have, have gone through tragedies, have gone through heartbreaks, have gone through disappointments, and have questioned God. Why? Why me? Why do I go through these things? But you know, we, we have always, uh, we've always known that God is good, those of us that are saved, and yet we know we're going to go through difficult things. We're going to go through hardships. We're going to go through heartbreak. And yet we know that God is good. But people question whether or not God is good. People look around and they, they say, well, how can God be good if he allows these things to happen? Why do, why do you say that God is good? Look at the terrible things that are happening in the world today. Look at all of these things that, that are taking place. But yet you say God is good. But you know what? I was raised in, 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 in saying those things about God, in believing those things about God. Even though I was lost, I knew that God was good. I would say a blessing. We learned it in school. My, I can't remember what grade it was in which my teacher taught us the blessing. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we are fed. Thank you, Lord, for our daily bread. And boy, we used to say that as children. God is great. God is good. And so we would, we would say that because we really believed it, that God was good. God was great. God is good. And so we would think about God being good. But yet as we get older, we would see things happening and people would begin to question, well, is God really good? Is God that type? Is God good that, that we could say that he's good? Look at the things that are happening in the world today. Is God really good? Do you remember the psalmist in Psalm 100 verse 5 said, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. What? God is good. Why is he good? Because his mercy is everlasting. Well, you know what mercy is? Mercy is, is when we don't get punished for the way that we ought to be punished. When we don't receive what we should receive, that's, what, that's mercy. That's when God's mercy is wonderful because we're not getting what we should get. We're not being punished the way we should be punished. And so God is great. God is good because he, his mercy endures forever. His mercy is everlasting. And he withholds the punishment that I should get. Boy, I tell you what, I should be punished on a regular basis for the life that I lived before I got saved. And then I could throw in for the life that I've lived after I got saved. All of the different times that, that I have lived before I got saved, after I got saved, boy, I should have received some punishment. And you know what? If, if everybody was honest, you'd have to look and say, you know what? There's been some things in my life that I should have been punished for. But God's mercy is everlasting. That is that he withholds the punishment that we should get but he doesn't give it to us. Psalm 107 verse 1 said, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Here again, the psalmist says that his mercy endures forever, that we're not going to be punished the way that we should be punished because we are God's child. We got saved and he doesn't, he doesn't pour on the punishment. He doesn't bring out the belt. He doesn't punish us for what we should be punished for. So he says in Psalm 107, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Boy, we ought, to, we ought to be thankful to God that he doesn't bring out the belt the way that he should bring out the belt. You know that we are sometimes... We're, we're quick to jump at people. When they don't do what's right, 
We're quick to jump at me. We're ready to punish people. We're ready to unleash on people. Imagine if God had that attitude. Imagine if God was that way, that he would punish us uh, immediately rather than, rather than have mercy and that would look at and analyze it and realize that we are, we are people that make mistakes and God has mercy on us. He doesn't bring about punishment. God is good. And boy, we ought to be thankful. We ought to, we ought to be a people that stop. During, and You know, we talk about the Christmas season. And here we are in December, and we talk about what how how wonderful God is. But we ought to we ought to really stop and really thank God for His goodness to us. All the everything that He has done for us. Sometimes we just fail to see the good. You know that's the problem with most people, and I throw me in the in the in the loop real quick is that we focus on the bad and fail to see the good so many times people will look around and say how can god be so good how can you say god is good well look at all the wars that have been going on look at the war the world wars look at the terrible things that have happened look at the horrors that have taken place Look at the deaths that have taken place. Look at the earthquakes and the violence that's going on. You say God is good, but yet look at all the bad things. And you know what, what happens is people focus on the bad things and fail to see all the great good things. And so sometimes one bad thing will take over and become more important than hundreds of good things. You give you an example. I'll use me for an example because I know that you don't have any problems like this. But I'll give you an example of what I have a problem with. I hate spinach. I just don't like spinach. I mean, I just don't. Now, I've eaten it when, when it's in some type of dish or something that I don't see it and I don't taste it. But I don't like spinach. But you know why I don't like spinach? I don't like spinach because of the taste. I don't like the way it tastes. Now, I eat it in the salads when it's raw, but I don't like it when it's cooked. I just don't like the taste of it. But you know what the doctor told me? The doctor told me that there were, there were 99 reasons why I should eat spinach. It would... The main, the number one reason, number one reason, it'll make me live longer. It's good for my heart. It will keep my arteries cleaned out. It will keep my blood vessels cleaned out. It will help with this. It will help with that. And on and on and on. 99 reasons why I should eat spinach. Number one, it will let me live longer. But you know why I don't eat it? Because of the taste. There's one reason why I don't eat spinach and 99 reasons why I should. But what do I focus on? The one reason why I'm not going to eat spinach. In other words, that's what people do. People focus on the one bad thing and they fail to see the 99 good things. And that's the way we are with God. We look around and we find something that's happening in this world and we blame God for it and say, look at, God's not good. Look at this terrible thing that's happened. And yet they have failed to stop and analyze all of the good things that God has done for them. All of the great things that God has blessed them with. And yet, what do they do? They see a war over there. And they say, God's not good. Look at that war over there. Well, did you wake up this morning? Yeah. Uh, did you see the sunrise this morning? How beautiful it was? Yeah. Did you have a roof over your head? Yes. Did you have water 
to come out of the faucet this morning? Yes. Did you have something in the refrigerator? Yes. Did your electricity work? Yes. Do you have a car? Yes. Do you have a job? Yes. Do you have some money in the bank account? Yes. On and on and on. Yes, yes, yes. But you know what? God's bad. God's bad because, did you see, there's a war going on over there. We focus on one bad thing and we fail to see all of the 99 good things that God has blessed us with today. And that's what I want to just focus in on just for a minute. And that is that God is so good. And I want us, I've just got two things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, just two things that I want us to look at. And the first one is this. I want us to look at the fact that God is so good to lost people. I want you to see that God is so good to lost people. The first thing that I thought about when I was thinking about how God is so good to lost people is this. That God created people even though he knew that they would turn their back on him. He created those people even though he knew they were going to reject him, that they were going to turn their back on them, on him, that they would have, they would curse him, that they would have nothing to do with him, and yet he created them and they woke up this morning and they've got money in the bank. They've got a car to drive around in. They've got a home to live in. They've got a roof over their head. They've got a heater that keeps them warm. They've got an air conditioner in the summer to keep them cool. They've got, they've got numerous things. They can, Sunday morning, they'll get up and go play golf. They'll, they'll, they'll get up and head out and go fishing. They've got all these different things. That they've got so many things. They've got computers at home. They've got games to play. They've got all kinds of things. that They live in a world that is a blessing, and yet they have no need for God. They don't, even, they don't think about going to church. They don't think about worshiping God, and yet God has blessed them. He created them, and they have such blessings. And you'd stop and think of it. God didn't have to create them. He knew from the very beginning that they were going to reject him and they were going to curse him and they were going to have nothing to do with God. They were going to live and they were going to die without ever getting saved, cursing God, and yet God has given them so much. If you stop and think that God is so good, he created them even though knowing that they were going to reject him. God is also slow to anger. Think about that. God is slow to anger even to the laws who curse him. God is slow to anger. Boy, I tell you what, my daddy wasn't slow to anger. <laughs> now, my mama was. Mama, mama just kind of put up, she put up with, with me, but daddy didn't. And I, and, and, and we had some other folks that, that, that kind of raised me and took care of me. And they were not slow to anger. I, I'm telling you right now that some of them, they wore old flip-flops all the time. And the one thing I feared was a flip-flop. I'm telling you, I could see a flip-flop coming from a mile away. Because when I got in trouble, that flip-flop came off that foot. And they got a hold of my hand. And that flip-flop came from around, I mean, all the way from the back of their back coming forward, whoop, and they would pop me that flip. I had such fear of flip-flops <laughs> that even to this day when Sue leaves flip-flops at the back door, I break into sweats when I see that thing. <laughs> flip, I tell you, but you know what? But God is slow to anger. God will put up with people that hate him, and yet we think, why didn't God come down and strike them down dead? Because God is slow to anger, and we better be thankful that God doesn't strike everybody down that, that turns against him. Another thing that I thought about is that God loves the lost as much as he loves the saved. You know that God loves even people that curse him? God loves the lost just as much as he loves the saved. Uh, God loves the lost so much that he put a desire in their heart to be saved. 
He put a desire in their heart. Now, they won't, maybe they won't act on it, but you know what? I was lost, and God loved me, and God had put a desire in my heart to come to know Him as my Savior. I didn't for a long time, but that desire to know God came from God. God put that desire in my heart, and he put a desire in your heart. He put a desire in your heart that you would come to know the Lord as your Savior. He didn't make you get saved, but that desire was always there because God puts it in our heart. God hears prayer. Here's one that I thought about that I thought, you know what? God hears the prayers of the saved for the lost. God hears the prayers of the saved for the lost. You know what? When, when saved people pray for lost people, God doesn't reject that prayer just because that person is lost. God loves them so much that he, he will listen to your prayers for that kin person that you have that's lost. God will take the time to listen to what you are praying. God will take the time to listen to what you're saying because he loves not only you, but he loves that lost person that you're praying for. And he will take the time to listen to that. God allows the lost to share in the blessings of the saved. There's another one that I thought about. You know, there's lost people all around us that, that wind up being blessed because God is blessing us. That there's family members that are lost, that, that receive blessings because God blesses us. In other words, God allows them to receive the blessings even though they're lost. But yet God blesses them because he is blessing you, he's blessing me, he's blessing everybody around us, and and then the lost person is over there, and they receive blessings because they're around us. I've got, I've got family members that are lost, but yet they have received blessings because how God has blessed my family. And that's the way God works. Here's another one. God invites the lost to be saved. You know, what, a, what an amazing thing to think of that even the lost that reject God, that curse God, that don't want anything to do with God, and yet God gives an invitation to them to be saved. He wants them to be saved. That's just, that's how God blesses even the lost people. God is so good even to lost people. God hears the prayers of a lost person when they pray for salvation. Well, we are, I tell you what, what a blessing that is. God doesn't have to hear their prayers, but yet God hears that prayer when that person stops and prays and asks God for forgiveness. Do you remember, can't remember that little girl's name. What was her? Something? Faye Tucker. She was a, she was a prisoner on death row in Texas. She made, she made headline news. Tammy Faye Tucker? No, Tam, I'm thinking the other Tammy no. Faye. Wasn't Tammy Faye Tucker. Something Faye Tucker, I think it was. I can't remember. But she had murdered two people with a pickaxe. Had, had killed them with a pickaxe. She was sentenced to die by lethal injection in Texas. Before she got uh, killed uh, in the, uh, uh, with, the, with the lethal injection, she was led to the Lord by, by a chaplain in the prison. And that became, that became big news. That was, it was a, this was in 1998. And I remember, and I remember it was, it was such a big thing because everybody was, there were people outside of the, and I remember when it was happening, it was on the evening news all the time. And people were, people were making such a big to do that, that she shouldn't be executed because she had gotten saved in prison. And then that became a big to do because 
the news media was making a big thing out of it that well that, that people believe that she can be forgiven of these sins and, and all this other stuff. And it went on and on and on and on. And, and she was eventually executed. Uh, she became the first woman since, I can't remember when, that was executed in prison. And, and people were making such a big do out of it. And, but the thing that, that after I got saved, and I remember reading an article about it one time years ago, uh, about the fact that, that people had made such a big to-do out of the fact that she claimed she could get saved, and that her life was different, her life was changed. She had petitioned to, be, to, be, to receive a life sentence rather than to be executed, but they, they went ahead and executed her anyway. But that was the sentence to start with. But the thing that so many people had a hard, a difficult time with it was the fact that she claimed that God had forgiven her. And I thought, what's such a big deal? Isn't it good to know that God hears the prayers of a lost person when they ask for forgiveness, when they ask for salvation, Nobody, you know, it, it, it's she, she got what had been, what she was sentenced to. She died by lethal injection. But the thing that we have to realize is that even a pickaxe murderer can be forgiven of their sins. God can forgive a, a serial killer. God can forgive somebody that does the most horrible of crimes. We tend to want to try to put people in some kind of category because of their sin and say, well, I'm not sure that God would forgive that person. Well, you know what? If, if we're uncertain that God could forgive her, then just maybe God might not be able to forgive us. When, when a person prays and asks for salvation and prays that their sins be forgiven, it doesn't matter what they've done, they can be forgiven of those sins and they can be saved. It doesn't matter. But yet people want to make such a big to-do out of some major, major crime or sin that somebody commits. It doesn't matter. Every one of us, who was it, James, that said if you've committed one, one sin, you've committed all the sins? That means if you lied about something, took something, if you did, if you made one sin, that means you committed her sins. That committed, you, you committed all the sins. A person that commits sin can be forgiven of God. That's what makes God so good. God is so good that he can forgive us of all of our sins, every one of our sins. I want you to also understand that God, God not only is so good to lost people, but God is so good to save people. God is so good to us. Why? Because he's given us eternal. He's given us everything that we went to him. We sought forgiveness just as that lost person did. That was us. We were forgiven. And he's so good that he has given us eternal, everlasting life. God hears our prayers. God gives us immediate access to him. God is so good that he allows us to walk with him each and every day. God is so good that he, that he will, not, will not discipline us in an immediate time period, that he's, he's slow to anger, that he will give us the same blessings. God is so good to us, he's given us the Holy Spirit to guide us. God is so good that, that he is with us each and every day. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. 
You see, so the point is that God is so good that he's good to lost people and he's good to save people. It doesn't matter. God is always with us and God is good to us no matter what. So let's 